And here they come. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yeah, when I'm sharing, I can't see much of that. Oh, I see we have 98. OK, 104. So for those of you who are here already, we're waiting for everybody else. There's about 700 people registered. So um, this might take a few minutes. So one thing I wanted to do was kind of a poll, but I couldn't figure out in Zoom how to do it. And that was to ask everybody what their favorite tree was. And um, I thought maybe what I would do is ask, ask people to throw it in the chat. <clears throat> now, are we actually recording or should we start doing that? It is recording. Okay. So because there are going to be literally hundreds of voices on the Zoom, we, we and I as the speaker can't answer you directly because I would never be able to complete the presentation. Um, so I would ask your patience there. We have Tracy Takeuchi, my colleague at Cal Poly Pomona is going to field questions as they come into the chat as best she can. And uh, I'm gonna try to ignore questions and keep my mind on the presentation. So that's kind of what we're gonna do. Alexa Hendricks is my support person for the Ventura County Master Gardener Program. And she's also supporting me on the webinar today. And we are having some difficulties because of internet or we don't know why, but when I advance the slide, you guys won't see that for a bit. One of the problems is I don't know that you won't see it and I don't know when you'll see it. So this is uh, adds a little bump in the road for presentation and we ask your patience uh, for this internet connectivity issue. So with that, I think we're gonna get started. We don't have as many folks on as I would like. It's about 216 according to our participant list, but hopefully more, more will join us as we go. So happy Earth Day. Today is Earth Day. We kicked this presentation off uh, with Earth Day on purpose because it falls right around the time when California has its Arbor Day and then the National Arbor Day hits at some point. But in people's minds, we're talking about trees and the environment and things that are good for, for people and landscapes. And so that's, that's the timing. Uh, I'm Jim Downer. I work in Ventura County uh, for the University of California Cooperative Extension. You can see my email there. Please jot that down if you would, because if you have questions later, you can come back to me with that. Um, let's see, the talk today is primarily for tree owners. It's not for tree workers or even master gardeners, except if you're a master gardener that owns trees, certainly, uh, but is to try and get information out to everybody that is interested in trees, no matter who they are, whether they're professional or non-professional, but mainly targeted toward tree owners. And so that's our goal is to get you some really good information about trees today and how trees are really important in saving the world in many, many ways for all of us, for humans, for the environment, for the trees themselves, they're critical to our world. So our motto for these webinars, and there are five of them, is going to be grow trees. So Alexa, do we see this yet? Yes, good. Grow trees. It's not enough just to plant trees. And this is kind of coming out of the million trees movements that have occurred all over the place in different countries and different cities. People identify with the idea that we're gonna plant a million trees. And that's a really ambitious thing to do, whether you're a, a region or, a, or an entire nation, it's ambitious to plant a million trees. 
but it's also really um, of no help at all to us and the environment if those trees don't survive. Trees have to survive the planting process and then they have to be cultivated over their lifetime to develop into really great assets in our communities. And so as great as it sounds to plant a million trees, we really wanna grow a million trees. This is the emphasis. And so it's not enough just to plant trees, we really need to grow them. And this image that's gonna show up very soon is taken from a remote place in New Mexico, a dry canyon wash called Owl Canyon. And this is a, an oak that's growing in that, that very remote place. And uh, I just got a note that my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so do we see this image yet, Alexa? Not yet. Okay, now we see it. So this is to show you sort of what a tree can do and how beautiful it can be with absolutely nobody touching it. This is a very remote place where nobody ever laid hands on this tree and it has developed and it has dead wood and live wood, but it's, it's like the penultimate view of what a tree could be. And oaks are, are known for their permanence, their beauty and their utility in landscapes. And um, even in the wild and native landscapes, they have all these things. So we want to try to cultivate trees like this. And um, I've switched slides and I'm trying to use Alexa to tell me when that slide shows up for all of you to see. So I'm, the, the pace of the webinar is a little bit challenging. Anyway, Trees really do help to make a better world. And here we see a scene from the Magnolia Garden in Kiev, Ukraine. And people are just so excited to be out there. You see in the, in the foreground that there are people taking selfies under the magnolias behind the fence. People resonate with trees. They want to be among them. They want to basically immerse themselves in the beauty of trees. And these benefits um, while we're out there exposing ourselves to trees are, are apparent right then, but what you might not realize is that the benefits are far more reaching. So today we're gonna talk about some of the tree forms and shapes, some of the features that trees have, just general, uh, very you know, basic elements of arboriculture. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how to select a, a tree to plant. Right now, planting is on everyone's mind because it's Arbor Day and we want to uh, get out there and be a part of Arbor Day and, and Earth Day and contribute to the greening of the world. And so it's really important, I think, to know how to to select the right tree for, for that planting. And then in the next webinar, we'll talk specifically about how to plant. So uh, are we seeing the next one yet? Okay. So here, here is just two broad categories. In general, trees have two big categories, deciduous and evergreen. And in the North American temperate climate, or European temperate climates, evergreens tend to be cone-bearing trees or conifers, pine, spruce, larch, fir, that sort of thing. In Southern California, evergreens tend to be tropical like this ficus. And you can see somebody was absolutely slain in the spirit here in, in the corner of this picture by the enormity of this tree. And it's a magnificent tree in Ventura, California. And then on the right, we see a forest in uh, Northern Italy, that's completely uh, deciduous forest. All the leaves have fallen off the trees and they're in a state of dormancy. So trees have a very, very different way of surviving the winter and surviving times of cold or drought or adversity. The deciduous lifestyle definitely accomplishes that. It removes all the leaves from the tree and basically resets the clock for a tree's leaves. And then in the spring, the tree develops a whole new canopy 
and has fresh leaves for a year until they fall off again. So these are very different ways that trees deal with their, their, their life. And we have two main kinds of shapes of trees. We have trees that are more or less Christmas tree shaped, which we call X current shape. And we have the broad dome tree, which is called decurrent. Sometimes it's called deliquescent. But the dome shape and the Christmas tree shape are two very specific forms that trees have. And then we can alternate and sort of mix and match these two forms to create all the other kinds of shapes, vase shapes, inverted vase shapes. And there are numerous forms that shade trees present. But these are the two basic forms. Now, when we plant trees, we have to know what they're going to turn into. Because if you're going to plant a very tall, narrow specimen, and at, just getting it from the nursery, you may not recognize that. But later in life, that's what it's going to do. Or if you plant this ficus macrophylla, you're going to get this huge, sprawly monster. And if there's not room for that, then you're going to be trying to do pruning that's going to want to modify the shape of the tree in a way it doesn't want to grow. So understanding the basic shapes of trees, and in particular, the shape the tree you're interested in is going to become, that really can guide whether or not it's the right tree uh, to be planting in any, any given landscape or park or setting. And I just want to show you this. This is a very famous garden. This is Kuchenhof Gardens in the Netherlands. And people go there from all over the world, and it's the Disneyland of horticulture. Kuchenhof is open for about six weeks in, um, in the time when all the flower bulbs are in bloom. And, and then it's closed again for the rest of the year to, while they redo the gardens. And I just want you to, to see millions of people go to Kuchenhof every year to enjoy the tulips and the other bulbs that they have. And if we take the trees out of Kuchenhof, all we really are left with is tulips. And um, I'm waiting for, for Alexa to give me the high sign. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so you can see if we depopulate the landscape of trees, the effect it has. Trees have an unbelievable effect on the landscape. And I was thinking about, well, what really is that effect? And I think it's the effect of permanence. You know, if you take the trees out of Kuchenhof, what have you got left? Well, you just got tulips. And tulips are great. I mean, it's Holland after all. What would you have without tulips? And that's why people go there to see this amazing tulip bloom. But without the trees, the tulips just don't impress as much, do they? Trees have a significant impact, not only on the landscape, but on the people in the landscape. And this is a reason we really want to be planting more trees. So I know I'm shifting gears very hard for you now. And some people may not like this shift, may not agree with it, may not even believe in it. But the climate is changing. And there are a few undeniable things that we, we know about climate change. One undeniable thing is that there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there ever has been in recorded history. And so the curve on the left is a famous thing called the Keeling curve. And it basically is the concentration that goes up and down each winter and summer of carbon dioxide. And you see the little zigzag line. It goes up and down because carbon dioxide changes during the year. But for the first time ever, we've gone above 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what this does is it tends to let radiation from the sun in, but not let it back out very well, so the climate warms. And then combined with this is the intensity of drought. So this is the very most recent US drought monitor map showing that right now where I'm at in Southern Arizona and then in that place between Utah, Arizona and Nevada, there is severe drought. And this, this drought monitor moves around, it changes all the time. 
And every two weeks or so, you can get a new version and see where the drought has shifted. But in the last decade or so, drought has been intense in the Western states of the United States and continues to intensify. Our drought severities and extent have increased. And um, this is very closely tied to the carbon dioxide increases. So why am I telling you about this in a tree study or a tree webinar? Trees play a big role. If we utilize trees and we cultivate them and grow them well, then we will not solve the increased CO2 with just our tree plantings, but we may help. And we will not solve the drought problem, but we can take away some of the bad effects that drought brings. So I offer you this slide and um, this is a slide that shows the difference between Bad Axe, Missouri, and Blythe, California. And so I ask you, where would you like to be right now? Or particularly when Blythe is 120 degrees, the presence of green canopy is so critical to modifying our environment, to cutting down uh, the heat island effect that cities have, to absorbing the solar radiation, and turning it into transpired water that cools the surrounding uh, buildings. These are some of the big ways that trees make a difference. And if trees are growing, they're also absorbing a little bit of that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and helping us drive the keeling curve a little bit slower so that it doesn't get much worse so fast. And so now I'm moving moving my slides again, and this time I'm moving to the town of Tucson, Arizona. And I'm showing you two residences in Tucson. And the one on the left, at some point, Alexa's gonna see it, yes, okay. The one on the left has no trees at all in the front yard. And somebody has meticulously cultivated that gravel and probably maintains it more than the person on the right maintains their trees. But the residents on the right, while not so neat, has the benefit of a huge mesquite tree and it covers the entire front yard. And that tree is gonna give the benefit of shade in a climate again, where it gets you know triple digits for over 60 days a year. And the, the impact of that tree is gonna be substantial. It's going to cut down the use of energy it's going to increase the benefits of shade and also provide habitat for animals. Now, in this image, we're going back to Kuchenhof um, because when I was there, I, I had the luxury of witnessing somebody having a tree hugging moment. And uh, you can see in the picture here, this amazing tree, it's large and it's, it's been well pruned. There's absolutely no pruning cuts visible on this tree. It's been well developed and somebody's giving that tree a hug. And the reason why they're giving that tree a hug is because they are benefiting from that tree. <clears throat> they are in that physical presence of the tree and their well-being, their psychology, their physical well-being is being altered by that tree. And so maybe the other people, not so much, but at least the person hugging it is feeling that. And the other people probably are as well, but don't know it. And so we know that trees have direct impact on people's mental and physical health. And they also help to create a healthy environment. They're capturing carbon, they're providing ecosystem services, which I'll get into in a bit, and they're reducing the effects of pollution. And I offer you this scene, um, which will pop up in a second, which is a comparison of the cities of Chiang Mai in Thailand and Leiden in the Netherlands. And I just ask you, which, which image, when you look at that, do you feel more comfortable with? 
the one with the trees or the one with the wires and infrastructure. And you can just see images like this and they impact your, your sense of, of self and your well being. And the more treed environment is always a much more inviting and I would say romantic environment for humans. And so trees have this impact on us. They assert a level of comfort and well being over our presence in that environment. And there is an author from the University of Washington, Kathy Wolf, and she is a social science researcher. She, she analyzes the research of other people. And she has done an amazing paper just recently, a scoping review of urban trees and human health. And it was published in 2020. And she's categorized the various ways that trees impact us. And so we have reducing harm. So by harm, this would be noise, pollution, heat, ultraviolet rays, and actually in, in reducing crime and increasing safety for people. So we know that trees have these impacts on communities. And then restoring capacity. Trees give us greater psychological functioning. They boost our ability to focus. They improve stress recovery. They elevate our mood. They increase our active living function and our attention restoration. And finally, 28% of the papers that she reviewed suggest that urban trees encourage wellness on a both individual and community level, which includes cardiovascular functioning. And so you're, you're more likely to be healthy in a well-treated environment. You're going to have more capacity. You're going to be less harmed. And people have known this in other countries. For instance, in Japan, they have the, the um, concept of Shinrin Roku, which is forest bathing, going out into the forest as an actual therapeutic or restorative practice. And so this is a known thing. Now, the trick is, it, you know, it would be nice if we didn't have to travel to our our supportive environment, if we could have it right by us all the time, right outside our house, down our street, in our community, if it was an integral part of where we lived and worked. And that's called urban forestry. You know, having trees available to us is going to give us all those benefits I just went over. And this is a chart that shows, and it's adapt, it's not anything anyone published, it's something I've developed but it talks about the lifespan of a tree in different places. So in a forest, trees can grow easily over a hundred years or much longer, much older. And as we move from forest to farmland, to suburbia, to towns, to you know, outskirts of cities, to the city center, the lifespan of a tree is reduced down to only teens of years, 15, 20 years, and then the tree will die and it'll have to be replaced. And so in those environments, trees not thriving, you can imagine that people are also not going to be thriving. So I have also noted here that this trend is consistent with little litter fall and a lack of mulchable space. Um, this, this is something we will talk about in a little bit more in the future webinars, but having a place for trees to actually drop their leaves is really critical to their survival. And if we go to a forest, and here I show you, eventually I show you that is a scene from the Chiricahua Mountains where I'm currently living um, of a forest. And we, do we see it yet, Alexa? We're still waiting. Oh my. Okay, so, and I'm making the point here with a haiku that I composed for this image and my colleague Tracy helped me uh, uh, create in the longer 7117 verse form. But it's making the point that trees are messy and they drop stuff all over the ground. And, and that stuff that they drop is critical to their health and critical to their, their life. 
So leaves, branches, fruits fall as mulch. Mulch settles like a carpet over the soil's surface. The forest thrives in decay. And, and this is so much true. Forests and trees need this environment to survive and thrive on their own without any input from us. And if we take them into cities, we take away so much of the element that they have evolved to grow in that we end up re relying on irrigation and fertilization and other practices to help them achieve their potential. So now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, the different components of a tree. And so, you know, probably the one that everybody identifies with is the wood or the stem. And, you know, anybody who's at home doing kind of home construction projects, if they, if you might've gone to Home Depot, you, you found out that a two by four isn't four bucks anymore. It's more like 10 bucks for an eight foot two by four. So the cost of wood has gone through the roof in the pandemic. And, and wood is really valuable building material. It's light, it's stronger than steel for its weight. Um, and not only that, it can be very beautiful. So here we see a cross section of a eucalyptus tree. This happens to be red gum eucalyptus. And it's showing you the light colored sapwood and the dark red heartwood, which makes amazing floors and furniture and the very thick phloem or bark. And uh, sometimes we call the bark the periderm. Now the sapwood is the part of the tree that does all the, the water movement. And the heartwood is mostly a place where the tree stores its waste product. So it's not, it structurally supports the tree, but it's not functioning in the physiology of the tree. So you can see this is a pretty good sized tree and it's relying on that cylinder of white tissue to keep its entire canopy going. And, and so it's really important for trees to keep growing. And how do they do that? They grow because there's a vascular cambium and it's, um, it's hold on a second. It's right here is the vascular cambium. And it's between the bark and the phloem and that little layer of cells generates all the bark and all the, all the wood. And so without that meristematic layer of cells, trees would stop growing, would stop getting larger. So it's critical to their survival. So moving on again and I'm, I'm again taking you back to trees at Kuchenhof because they're so dramatic. I find the trees almost more dramatic than the tulips. And you see that it's the stems, the trunks that really impose the, the feeling of a forest upon you. And of course the branches and the architecture of the tree are, are also beautiful and we admire that, but uh, these large stems rising up out of the the turf in this case, um, support the architecture of a tree's canopy. And what is this all for? It's to get the leaves in an ideal spot so they can catch sunlight. So what is a tree? It's a gigantic photocell array or collector and the, the stems and the branches and the trunks, they're just all the stuff that hold the leaves up there so they can get the sunlight. And they are essential. And this is why trees evolved stems and trunks and branches is they had a big advantage over tulips. They could get light that the tulips are not gonna get. Although in this case, I guess the tulips do get enough light. So now we're diving into the inside of stems. And um, in this image, which will eventually come to your screen, you will see two things. You see on the left, um, a, a close shot, of, it's about a hundred power of an oak tree stem with all those holes in there. And those giant holes are the vessel elements that move the water. And in most cases, the vessels are only active 
in in the last few um, in the last few increments. So this layer right here is active in sending water, and this one is still partially active, but a lot of these vessels are getting plugged up, and these layers back here are not active at all. So it's this young last season growth that's so critical for trees. And this is where the water is moving. Now you see these other lines in the wood that are going like this into the middle like spokes. These are called rays. And the rays in wood allow the tree to communicate from the bark or the phloem here, here's the phloem, with the wood or the xylem out here, here's the xylem. So the sugar is coming down the phloem and it gets to one of these rays and then the sugar can move from the phloem into the wood. And then since the rays are composed of cells that are alive, they can hold on to that, that sugar by converting it into starch. So in this other uh, picture, we have kind of a tangential section. So if we cut a tangent on that other slide, so in other words, if we cut through it like this and look at it from the side, this is what it is. And we see here these little purple dots. Well, these are starch grains that have all reacted with iodine in the wood of a tree. And this is also an oak, a sample of oak wood. And so we see that the wood has stored a lot of starch. This all came from the leaves. The leaves made the sugar, it came down through the bark, and then it was deployed into the wood as stored starch. Now, this is really an important function of stems to store sugar. Because imagine if you're a deciduous tree and you're going through the cold, hard winter and spring comes along, you have to wake up and you have to grow an entire canopy of leaves off of what? There's nothing there except the buds and, and you need that stored energy from the wood to get the canopy to form. And so storing starch is really critical in many trees and the wood and, and the young sapwood is where this is done. Now we're, we're back to the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona, uh, where we see a tree that is something called lichen. And uh, I'm waiting for Alexa's high sign that I know that you can see the slide. There we go. So lichens grow on trees, but don't harm them. And lichens are a tremendous indicator of um, a healthy environment, because if you have air pollution or you have deposition of acid rain or other things like that, lichens tend not to grow well. And so here in this very remote area of Arizona, everything's covered in lichen. And curiously, um, in the nuclear exclusion zone of Chernobyl, everything is covered in lichen uh, because there's very little air pollution there. So lichens, sometimes allow us to understand if a tree has stopped growing because they'll just grow on dead bark and they'll grow very abundantly. And bark on trees usually sloughs off if it's actively growing. So lichens are kind of an indicator that the environment is healthy, but also that a tree is growing a little bit more slowly because they, they need a slowly growing surface to, to develop on. talk a little bit now about the leaves of a tree. So the stems are there so that leaves can have orientation and advantage of getting sunlight. And so here we see ginkgo biloba in my own yard in Ojai, California, with the sunlight shining through the leaves. Leaves are photosensitive solar arrays. They are there to collect photons. Their whole function is to capture energy and use their two photosystems to convert electrons from a low energy state to a high energy state. And that's converted into ATP and that is used in biochemical reactions to create carbohydrate. So carbon dioxide is coming into the leaf. The 
leaf is using the energy from the sun to combine that carbon dioxide with water and make sugar. So the energy is put into the carbon dioxide and water to create the bonds that, that make the sugar. And then later on, it can take that energy back out of the sugar molecule to do the business of cellular respiration and growth. And all of this has to occur with something else going on and that's called transpiration. So leaves have tiny pores called stomata that open uh, when photosynthesis is happening and carbon dioxide diffuses in just randomly because of what's in the air goes in the leaf. And then water vapor comes out of that leaf. So we can't have photosynthesis without having the stomata open and transpiration occurring. So this gets a bit complicated at this point, but uh, the photosynthetic efficiency depends on how much water is lost for a certain unit of carbon captured. So the more carbon that a tree can accumulate with the less water lost is its photosynthetic efficiency. So you can see then that uh, trees have a conundrum, capture carbon and make sugar without losing water. So most of the water in trees goes out through the leaves. 90, 90 plus percent of the water is just lost in transpiration. And a few percent are used to make the energy reactions to make sugar. So trees are not particularly efficient with water in terms of using it to make sugar. But that lost water is a great manipulator of our environment. It cools the environment. It uh, modifies and reduces the load of energy on our buildings. Uh, and, and it increases the humidity around the tree. So in an arid Western climate, that's really a good thing. Maybe not so much in a moist Eastern climate. Trees are also dust filters. Um, they cut down on the amount of dust that um, hits the ground, they keep it out of the atmosphere and provide protection really from dust for uh, landscapes and homes. And then that dust all gets washed to the ground during rainfall and serves as fertilizer for the trees. We know that dusts on trees contain significant amounts of N, P, and K. Particularly in cities, there's almost too much nitrogen that occurs in the dusts on trees. So they really get a dose of fertilizer from the dust that is collected when they get rained on. And so those dusts and particulates get washed down to the root system. And roots is another thing of trees that people really, I think, maybe don't understand as well as they should. And arborists that work on trees even might have to think about this a little bit more often. And one of the things is on the top cartoon that, um, Trees are very surface rooted. We're talking the top 12 inches here. So, you know, most of the roots, like, I don't know, 98% of them are in the top 12 inches. And I can't write very good with the cursor. There we go. And below that, there are very few roots. The other thing about tree root system is that it's very uneven. It doesn't necessarily like a perfect wagon wheel or spider web that spins out from the main trunk. All the roots of a tree can be almost all on one side of the tree. And this depends on the soil factors, which scientists call edaphic factors, that the tree is trying to grow through. And so trees grow roots where it's favorable for them to do that. And that's generally in the top six inches wherever the soil is uh, uncompacted and, uh, and where there is good soil, where there is nutritious soil that has water in it. So tree root systems are very susceptible to compaction. If we walk on the soil, if we drive cars over the soil, if we play uh, games or have pets is even the worst thing uh, that are fenced under trees, the soil is really deteriorated by that that traffic. So trees and forests rely on the process called litter fall to drop their leaves, their fruit, their branches, their dead squirrels, their insects, and their dust onto the ground. And that forms a kind of mulch. And this is the way that trees recycle their nutrients. 
So all the minerals that were absorbed by the roots end up in the leaves and then they fall off and they go back down to the ground and they decay and the, the organic leaf is mineralized back to its constituent elements that the tree can take back up. So that's cyclical. Without the mulching and the litter fall, trees are denied that. And then we have to do things like fertilize. The main thing to remember is that trees are not shallow rooted um, because of things we do. They're shallow rooted because they want oxygen. And the most oxygen is in the upper 12 inches of soil. So that's where trees really are gonna prefer to put their roots. And it's true, some trees tend to run roots along the ground more than others. So there are some taxa of trees that tend to have roots right on the surface and some taxa that tend to send them a little bit deeper. But in general, trees like to be shallow rooted. So here we're transitioning to another view and this is a view of a, a partner and this is a mushroom called Amanita muscari. And eventually Alexa is going to say that you can see it. There we go. It's a uh, common name is the fly agaric because flies would land on this and be poisoned by it. And so people in Europe would put these on their table and use them as a decoration to kill flies. And it also contains a chemical called LSD, which if you eat this mushroom, will cause you to have visions perhaps, and maybe even stomach pain, because uh, it is an ammonita and an ammoni ammonitas are generally very toxic. But what it also is, is a colonizer of this litter fall or mulch, the organic matter that's dropped onto trees. It's so important because this fungus is gonna associate with the roots of the tree and with the de decaying organic matter and connect the two together so that the recycling can happen. And so here is a really famous picture uh, that I stole from a botany textbook called um, um, Biology of Plants by Raven. And it shows the hyphal network of a seedling. And so the, the actual roots of the seedling are here and here, here, you can see them and here. And pretty much everything else you see is fungus. And so the increase in surface area from the affiliation of this pine seedling with the fungus is not 10x, it's like 100 times greater than what it would have if it were just relying on its own roots. Almost all trees have these relationships. And you may not see the hyphal network because it may not be this kind of mycorrhiza. It might be a kind that's harder to see, but all trees, almost all trees have mycorrhizal affiliations. The roots are inoculated and the hyphal network invades the soil. So one of the things I think um, tree care professionals and, and scientists even don't well understand is what is the horticulture of the mycorrhizae? What, what benefits these fungi so that they can benefit their shade tree partners? And that is a really interesting question and not studied, I, th I think. We know generally what, what the fungal partners like. They like a moist soil, they like aeration, they like oxygen and gas exchange. They don't want to be compacted. So a lot of the, <clears throat> the horticulture of mycorrhizae is probably the same as the horticulture of the tree. However, mycorrhizae also like organic matter. So they, they need a certain organic matter input in order to thrive. And so that brings us to this image. And this is an image of a large tree in Ventura County's backcountry, and it's a canyon live oak. Uh, and it will show up shortly, I hope. And it's showing you the amazing amount of mulch that's coming out of this tree. And it's, it's just falling down on the forest floor. Nobody's doing anything, it's a campground. And there's an old, um, stove box here on the ground. 
uh, but this tree is unmolested and it's got a circumference of maybe 10 feet at the base and it's generating mulch, it's generating leaves and branches and, um, and detritus that's falling down on the ground. And this is in turn feeding the soil food web under that tree. So the tree and its litter fall are intimately connected. And that in turn leads us to you know, ecosystem services. How do trees provide the assistance to the ecology that they create for themselves? Well, it's really complicated because if you start looking at things, trees produce fruit and birds eat that fruit and they, they um, excrete their fruit digestion in the trees, they get washed into the ground so nutrients are added. And then fungi get into trees and they create rotten wood and, and um, the acorn woodpecker pecks that out. And then the uh, whiskered screech owl, which we see on the left, moves into the ac ac acorn woodpecker's hole and makes a nest. And the plusius beetle eats the pollen off, off the uh, branches of conifers and cypress trees. And so all these things are interconnected. And the, the services that trees provide are reliant upon all these other partnerships. And so when we start taking away bits and pieces of this ecosystem, it makes it much harder for trees to survive. And you know, it also gets to be that when we expect trees to perform in our urban environment, in our built environment, the way that they survive and do in their ecosystem, that might be asking a little bit much because it could be that not all of the players in that system are present to, to interact with the tree. So this is a slide that's near and dear to my heart because right now in Southern Arizona, we have a wildfire going and behind my house, 1600 acres are on fire. And it's, it's not too near to me, but this was the Wheeler fire in Ojai in 2018. And I've composed another haiku for you. Do trees catch on fire? Trees and houses are inflammable. Plant not flammable houses. And the point is, yes, trees are made of carbon. They're going to burn, they can burn. But the most burnable thing usually is the house itself. And we know this is evidenced by images where wildfires, particularly in Northern California, have gone through. And all the houses are burned down with living trees standing around them. And it's just amazing. We are only now coming to the, you know, the really good realization that we need to plant flammable or not flammable houses. And, and that really is a critical thing. Fuel reduction is one thing, safe distances and that sort of thing, preventing ladder fuels, all those things are concepts. But having your house not be flammable is the biggest of all of those concepts. And so uh, talk today is not about fire, but I wanted to bring this up because sometimes people are hesitant to plant trees because they believe it'll create a fire hazard around their house. And I think the trick here is, is making your house less flammable, not restricting the amount of trees you have. And this actually is my yard in Ojai and you can see the tree line and the yard is completely surrounded by trees. And I'm not at all concerned about that. So I wanna give you a, a few ideas on selecting trees. As I indicated before, this is the time of year when people think about Arbor Day and uh, getting trees in the ground. And um, some people, because they plant trees every year, this time of the year, are almost compelled. We gotta find another place to put a tree. Uh, I have a fruit orchard and sometimes the fruit trees don't get planted until about now or maybe last month, but um, every year we're planting trees. So the key selection criteria for trees are to match the tree to its site, 
to find that tree that does the correct thing in the amount of space you have in your climate with the amount of soil you have and also to make sure there's enough light provided for your tree to do well and by the way this this tree at the national arboretum that's been espaliered is a ginkgo biloba and just an amazing espalier job done by the the um, botanists there at the National Arboretum. So it's always good to look around your neighborhood and see and sort of covet other people's trees. Look and see what they're going. Oh, that dogwood is spectacular. I want one of those. Well, if you see that it's growing well in your area and it's a tree that's good for you, and it looks like you have the right space to put it, well, then you're on the right path. You're finding something that does well in your area. And, and that's really key to doing this. You, picking a tree out of a catalog, you may get something that isn't right for your area. You'd have to do more research. So you need to consider the purpose of your tree. Is it for aesthetics, for shade, flowers, fruit, energy, ecology, what is it? Um, and, and then of course, select the taxa accordingly. And finally, you need to pick trees that are healthy and free of disease and defect. We're gonna talk about tree diseases in the last webinar quite, quite thoroughly. So we don't cover that here. And we're gonna talk about planting in the next webinar. So we're not gonna talk about that here, but we will say a few more words about selection. And I think one of the first things that you really need to realize is that trees get large depending on which one. So you could put, you could be putting a tree in the ground as an acorn and end up with something like this. Hopefully you'll see it real soon. Um, we're still waiting. Yes, trees get, trees can get very large. And why would you plant something with this potential in a very narrow parkway or a tight space where it can't develop? So if, if this is what you need in a particular space, great, plant one of these um, you know, huge oak trees. Uh, what you see under the understory down here is a crepe myrtle collection. So this is a whole collection of different crepe myrtle trees. And you can see how much smaller those are. They're like, you know, a tenth the size of this big oak tree. So we have a great potential in the genetics of trees to select a small tree or a very large tree. And it kind of depends on, you know, what your space allocation is. And I think the hardest thing for everybody is to visualize that full grown individual in their little tiny space and what that's gonna lead to. That's gonna lead to a lot of tree trimming a lot of removing big branches that you shouldn't have to remove, okay? So you've figured out your space, you've figured out the kind of tree you want and the size that it should be, and now you go out to get it. Well, and you go all the way to a nursery in Ukraine outside the capital city of Kiev. And here's what you find. You find these gigantic trees in little tiny bags because they've been grown in the field and they've been sort of temporarily put in these bags before planting out. In California, we tend to put these things in containers. So they'll be in gallon cans or fives or 15 gallon, or they'll be in boxes. And in some parts of the country, they'll be bald and burlap, or they'll be in tree bags, or they might even just be bare root in, in sawdust and you take home a bare root thing. Um, and they could even be trees you move from one place to another as a transplant. So the, the key thing though is that you should always plant the smallest tree that you think will do what you want it to do and that you can take care of. And the reason I say it in that way is because small trees don't survive well in parks or in schools or in public areas with a lot of people you know, a small tree just gets trampled and it doesn't survive to be a certain size. But a small tree in your own yard, say from a gallon can or a liner, which is a quarter inch pot uh, or a seedling, it could be cultivated and go very well for you and your yard. So the larger the tree you plant, 
the more time it will take to establish. The larger the tree you plant, the more money it will cost to ensure its success. The larger the tree you plant, the slower it will grow in your landscape. And the larger the tree you plant, the more money it will cost you. Okay, so this slide sort of reiterates that. Do you see it yet, Alexa? Maybe not. Hopefully it's coming to you soon. But the, the luxury of planting an acorn is really a luxury. And I've, I've sometimes made the, the uh, observation that we could just put down mulch and let animals plant the trees. And I've seen- You're breaking up. I don't know if it's your connection or mine. Oh, okay. Um, don't know. He's so, not breaking up on my side. Which slide do you guys see? The larger the tree you plant. Okay. So, Sorry for the internet connectivity issues, folks. It's, it's the Zoom reality these days. But, but this is a real thing that, you know, we should always plant the smallest tree we can and that we know we can take care of, that we can protect from other, from people stepping on it, first of all, if it's a seedling, or from uh, perhaps, you know, people damaging animals, eating or breaking. And then as we get into large box specimens, these really require monitoring and maintenance because we are basically importing a whole section of a different soil type and putting it in an, a new place with a, another different soil type and trying to get these two soils to match up and get the tree to put roots out into the existing uh, landscape soil. And that, that's not always a quick process and, and costs more money, it costs money to hire somebody to monitor this or to have skill to deal with it. The irrigation is tricky. Uh, the planting cost is not inexpensive. Okay, just going on about selecting the right tree. And um, Alexa's turned her camera off so I can't see her high sign anymore. But eventually you're gonna see this picture of not selecting multiple trunks. And this shows you, okay, thank you, Tracy. This shows you a picture of a tree that is almost unanimously or universally sold as a multiple trunk specimen, which is the European white birch. Uh, people want to plant three of these, and if they can do it from one container, so much the better. And then on the left, you see a picture of a, a cultivated mesquite that has actually failed at one of its stems because the attachment was weak. So multiple stem trees tend to fall apart as they age and get larger. And then you have damage to repair and furthermore, you no longer have your multiple. And so it's best just not to even engage in this kind of practice. Don't plant multiple trunk trees. They're really not sustainable in the landscape and they eventually fail. The only caveat on this admonition, if you will, is when a tree is really a glorified shrub, okay, like the crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtles are pretty much shrubs, but we've made them into trees. If you're gonna plant multiples of crepe myrtle, it's probably not a problem, okay? Because it's a, a tree that, are you raising your hand, Tracy? Okay, do you wanna talk? Yes, there's a question that is pertinent right now okay so i wanted to have you answer we'll that. have a we'll have an interlude for a pertinent question go ahead could you reiterate why the larger the tree planted the slower it will grow ah uh, okay think about kind of the and it's a great question why is it that the larger the tree planted the slower it will grow First of all, the science tells us that trees grow at the same rate their entire lifetime. That if you follow the growth rate of a seedling just growing in the ground and you monitor the biomass accumulation, 
it's pretty much linear over its entire life. So the growth rate doesn't change. So how can I say there are different growth rates? Well, nursery culture is not the same as growing something in the ground. And so nursery culture is relying on media, not soil necessarily, and on fertilization. And there's no mulching or litter falls, so there has to be fertilization. And on irrigation, you can't grow trees without those things in a nursery. And the soil type that's required to grow things in big containers is not the same as what we have in the ground. And furthermore, because we're relying on, on um, fertilization, the mycorrhizal relationships of nursery trees may not be the same as trees in the landscape. So the longer trees are cultivated in that way, the more likely they have root defects, they have girdling roots, they have uh, too many roots, uh, they have no mycorrhizal associations, and, um, and they get root bound over time in nurseries. And we have to take them from those conditions into field conditions. And so there's a big transition there. So the bigger the tree is, basically the longer it's been in the nursery, the slower it will be to establish in the landscape. And so you, it's just incremental. The bigger the box you plant, the slower, the longer it will take to get it fully established into the landscape soil. Now you think about a one gallon can or a five gallon can, you know, the, the roots of a plant growing in that container are going to be out in native fill. And as soon as they start to grow, the proportion of what's in the container versus what's out in the field, it, it's insignificant. The effect of the container is insignificant. So the small plant always establishes and grows, starts to grow to more linear in the field soil. So here's another thing. And this is to look for trees that have temporary branches. <laughs> Alina, you, I'm sorry, Alexa has her hand up. That means you can see the slide. <laughs> yes. So temp temporary so, branches. Just so you know, um, every time you speak her name, everybody who has that technology's device goes off. <laughs> so if you could avoid speaking that name, maybe she can be Hendrix today. Okay. Have you actually had somebody comment on that? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Well, you learn something every day, even in your own webinars. So um, thank you, Hendrix. Anyway, uh, when we cultivate trees in nurseries, very often the nurserymen will eliminate the lower branches to make it look lollipop-like and in their mind, and maybe in your mind, what looks like a tree in a pot. But actually those branches that should be on the lower stem that may have been clipped off are really important for the establishment of the tree. They put the stem from sunburn, they increase the taper, which is the increase in width at the bottom relative to the top. So a tapered tree is like this, right? And you get that tapered trunk by having temporary lateral branches. And if you have that tapered trunk, you don't need to stake the tree. It doesn't require staking. Um, so these temporary lateral branches are really critical and important. And if you can find nurseries that produce stock with temporary branches, it's always preferable. So another thing has to be said about when you select trees, you're, all, you're selecting the top, but you're also selecting the bottom part of the tree, which is the root system. And so the root system, really, really important. And as an artifact of being grown in a tiny pot in a nursery, sometimes the trees don't get moved up to the next size container efficiently or as quickly as they should be. And the root goes in a circle around that container. And that circular root stays with the tree its entire life and goes out into the landscape and starts to constrict the trunk. And this can be to the point where the tree will fail because it's an hourglass-like situation. And it, the tree will literally break off at the girdling root. 
And so these root defects are the artifacts of nursery cultivation. And when we purchase trees, you have to look at the root systems. And if you see a girdling root, don't pick that tree. And furthermore, be suspicious of every other tree in the nursery and look to see whether or not the root system is salvageable. And again, the youngest size tree will have the least of these defective roots and not have had them passed on from one size to the next. And so this brings to the idea of root washing and root inspection, which is something I'll take up a little bit more when we talk about planting next week, but actually looking, getting the soil off of the tree inspecting it to see what the root situation is and then correcting by cutting out the kinked or circling roots is an important aspect of selecting the right tree. So this, these slides are from Linda Chalker Scott from Washington State University who kind of pioneered the root washing for perennial plants. And uh, it's a practice that, you know, we shouldn't have to do, but because of nursery, nursery culture, um, we really need to inspect our roots before we purchase and before we, especially before we plant a tree. The other nice thing about root washing is that it takes away the media so we don't have an interface between our native soil and the, the trees growing media. And getting rid of interfaces in, in the soil is always a good thing horticulturally. So our next webinar is on planting trees, and it will be a week from today. And we will talk about all the planting is, is really fundamentally quite simple, but we've made it very complicated by lots of different products and procedures that may or may not be necessary. And we're gonna talk about the snake oil of planting, the early care after planting, or planting in this case, and site selection and modifications and what you don't need to do to a site to get trees to grow in it. And uh, all the other factors that are involved, including staking and such to get your new tree going. So with that, I'm gonna stop my sharing and um, hopefully Tracy, you've got some interesting questions that you've banked that I could- Oh maybe my gosh, about. I don't know. These, these people are very, very chatty, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we need to save the chat because I want to read it all later. Oh, yeah, it's a great chat. But I mean, the questions coming in are many, fast and furious. So um, hopefully I'm answering as best I can as we go. Um, let's see. Is it possible understanding what tools can we use to look forward to 30 to 50 years regarding climate change so that we are planting the right trees for our changing microclimates? Thank you. Well, I guess... Now I can talk so Tracy can scan the rest of the questions. Uh, that really depends on where you are. You know, trees, if, if you're on the East Coast or in Appalachian Mountains or something, trees are a given. There's trees everywhere. If you're in the desert Southwest, it's more like shrubs and sand dunes, right? And, and things that go dormant. And so... If you're somewhere in the middle, like a Mediterranean climate, like California, then what you're seeing is that climate is changing and things are getting hotter. And what we need then is trees that are more water use efficient. And also we're seeing for the first time in the last decade, native trees that can't tolerate native temperatures. And so we're getting these spike in our heat events and we need to look at trees that can withstand that basically. And so we're doing some research at UC on climate ready trees and looking at trees that are more adapted to hot climates. And I think that unfortunately is what we're gonna be looking for in the future of trees. What else, Tracy? So that kind of dovetails in with a later question that came in and I'm gonna ask that one of you next because it's pertinent. Um, could you talk about the relationship of redwood trees, roots and lawns? Huh. They probably both like water. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I guess that's a pretty open question and I, I could see it being bad for the lawn or bad for the tree. 
And uh, kind of depending on how you're maintaining the lawn, what kind of turf it is, um, with if you're using a lot of fertilizer. Redwoods, particularly the coast redwood, are adapted to something called fog drip. And so they're getting very pure water that's coming in, condensing on the canopy, dripping down into the root system. And that root system is blanketed in copious mulch. And so the interaction of trees and turf, which is a good thing to talk about, isn't always beneficial to both partners. Trees evolve the stems and branches and leaves to shade out turf so that the tree would have a competitive advantage. And turf, if in its purest sense, the grassland or the prairie, grows in absence of trees. It wants full sun as well. So you have this sort of competitive disconnect between trees and turf. Turf wants full sun, trees want mulch all over the ground. And so really tree and turf roots shouldn't mix if they had their way. And the aspect of the changing climate with regard to redwoods being suitable for the locations that they're planted in ornamentally is becoming uh, more strained than it was previously. So people who had successfully grown redwoods in some marginal locations will find that they're struggling more and more susceptible to diseases such as the Botryospherias. And you know, I want to, that comment, Tracy, and also the whole kind of direction of this conversation makes me think of the native plant advocates. I'm a native plant advocate. I love native plants. I like them in their native plant community. But unless you're willing to construct that entire ecosystem in your yard, just saying I'm planting a native, I mean, I could be planting a redwood, I'd be planting a native, but is that good in Bakersfield? Maybe not. So, you know, what is a native? In California, a native is a lot of things. And there are a lot of natives we just can't grow where we would want to, like Louisia. Louisia is a little alpine plant that wants to grow up high in the mountains and with pure water and snow melt. And you're just not gonna grow that down you know, in Salinas. It's not gonna do well, it's gonna get sick. So you know, the, the concept of native trees is great when they're growing in their native plant community, but just to plant them in your yard and call them native is a little bit, I don't know, you're, you're kind of asking a lot when you do that. So do we have another good one in there? So there was a lot of interest in that particular question because of the debacle currently over natives versus non-natives. And so I think what people also need to keep in mind is that there's a difference between an invasive plant and a non-native plant that can survive in our environment without becoming an aggressive plant that takes over environments it's not intended to. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're looking at the plants from those two perspectives, really. Um, and native yeah. plants can be invasive mm -hmm. if you take Absolutely. them somewhere, you know, where they have that potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for that question, where to go. Um, sorry about this, I have to scroll. And I apologize if I misspelled things yeah. in the in the uh, Q&A, but I don't spell well, and it doesn't seem to have a spell checker. <laughs> My bad. Um, a person is asking about, uh, Paula Strain is asking about Chinese elms in the backyard. I've already mentioned that they are very, considered to be an invasive tree if the habitat or the environmental conditions are right for Chinese elms, Ulmus corvifolia. Um, and there are some cultivars such as true green, which should never be planted due to their disease susceptibility. However, removing these trees, um, you know, typically it's going to depend on a lot of factors. So making recommendations like removals, you know, we're gonna be a little cautious with because chemical therapies used to control stump resprouting of removed trees, for example, varies from state to state and county to county. So what can be used in Southern California in Riverside may not be legal in Arizona. So when removing trees, the one thing that you need to consider is whether or not those trees can regrow from dormant trunk buds or from root sprouts. 
And if that's the case, then some considerations need to be taken in the steps to remove a tree so that you don't have a grove of little alders show up in your neighbor's backyard when you remove your alder. Lombardi poplar. Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Just say no. All right, just say no so to Lombardi So here's a poplar. question that's in the Q&A and I'll, I'll take this one because it looks interesting. Okay. It says, I live in a forest in southern southwest Virginia. I'd like to know how to care for forest trees that look like they're not thriving. In other words, since there are so many trees, the taller ones cause the smaller ones to take on strange shapes because of the effect it takes to get enough sunlight. Is it healthy to remove some of the compromised trees in a small forest? Yes, you're just sort of increasing what nature is already doing the healthy trees shade out the saplings and they either stretch and get light and develop or they fade away basically. And what I would say is if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna take some of the misformed children out of the forest, make sure you throw them through a chipper and leave the mulch behind so <laughs> the others can do well. Trees like that kind of thing, not so much for people, but you know, trees really like to feed off of the chopped up parts of other trees. And we'll get more into that in future webinars. Um, someone had asked uh, whether the um, mulch available from the garden center was better than uh, natural mulch occurring under the trees and natural accumulating leaf litter. And related to that, a second question was about how, what percent litter cover will reduce soil compaction under trees. I wasn't sure about the question, so I answered what I thought the question was. And so you might speak to that a little bit. Um, I remember the last part first, so I'll say something about that. Um, first of all, you know, compaction is not, it's not a, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It's not a finite thing. Compaction depends on the texture of the soil and how much it can be compacted. So it can be compacted to different amounts. And so compaction can be slight or severe. And so if a soil is severely compacted, it's going to take much longer for it to uncompact by whatever methods you're employing. So if the method you're employing is to put down mulch and let the microbiology of the mulch and the soil animals do the work for you, then it's, first of all, that will always take a certain amount of time. It takes time for that organic matter to, to create the effect of making the soil more porous. And it will depend on the texture of the soil, the degree of the compaction, and then finally on how you treat that organic matter. The organic matter is like a living thing in itself and it requires its own moisture. It has to be tended to a degree, you have to add new organic matter to keep it going. Think of it as like a sourdough starter. If you don't feed your sourdough starter, that stuff dies. And if you don't keep the organic matter coming, you know, with constant inputs, then it's gonna get used up and basically die. And then its effect on compaction is gonna go away. So um, we talk about this more later in the series, but th that's basically that. I forget what the first part of the question was, Tracy. No, I'm not sure I remember now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got four screens up. <laughs> so, you know, um, we're not going to be uh, able the to mulch. Get... The mulch we'll, from... we'll stay with this for a bit, but we may miss your question because the there's mulch a lot from of garden questions. centers, James. Oh, mulch from garden centers. I hate yeah, it. Yeah, the reason I said I would have you answer this alive is because I know mulch and compost and all of that is near and dear to your heart. Oh, I love it. The, the main thing about mulch from garden centers is you're paying for it by the bag. And then what's in that bag? Well, it may or may not be what you actually want. And then, you know, if your mulch is just for decorative purposes, uh, barks are fine. But if you want it to do something horticultural or biological to the soil, then it needs to be relatively fresh, full of, of wood cellulose that the organisms can grow on. And generally, you don't get that from bagged products in the nursery center. And um, we know not quite 
I just had a question, interestingly, about dyed mulches, and I just don't know the answers, you know, of how the dyes affect the breakdown and how they affect the microbial ecology of soil and all those things. It's just don't know a lot about it. I think the the mulches that are dyed black with iron sulfate probably is not a big deal, but uh, again, we just don't have the research on that. What we do know is that if you take a tree and you put it in a chipper and you put that down as mulch, that's a good thing. The fresh live mulch with wood and leaves in it, that's probably your most optimal thing. And then if you think about the litter fall process of, of how trees mulch themselves, they're basically constantly dropping stuff on the ground. So there's you know, inputs of new organic material every day. And so it, it's that constant regeneration of adding carbon to the soil. We don't have the luxury of adding mulch every day. So we're gonna be a little bit more intermittent about that. But mulch wears out, it goes away, it de degrades and degenerates and that's what it's supposed to do. And in order to keep that process going, we have to keep adding to it. So as frequently as you can stand doing it is probably a good idea and then adjust the volumes or the amounts to, to be appropriate. So there is a question or a comment, sort of a question about uh, leaf litter versus mulch versus arborist chips. I'm trying to advise on firewise planting and replacing dangerous trees being removed, replacing the dangerous trees being removed with safe trees it's an urgent problem in our communities, San Francisco Bay Area. Not enough info about trees out there. They're looking for um, litter information and the contribution about the litter to wildland fires. Um, the research on that I think is underway, but we, we've had discussions about this recently. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I will try and get a video on this for when we do our um, talk that's more oriented toward mulches. But basically, if you take a plumber's torch outside, uh, one of those <coughs> lighted on fire things, and you put that on your mulch and try to ignite it, if your mulch is horticulturally suitable, in other words, you're doing the right things to keep the mulch alive, you're keeping moisture in it, it's got fungi growing in it, it's doing all the good things you're gonna learn about later it's almost impossible to ignite that stuff. It does not catch fire. And so um, mulch isn't necessarily a flammability issue. And there's very little research-based information on it. There is some, but there's some problems with most of it. And uh, I would say the science on this is young. We're gonna learn more. And uh, right now, anyway, I would say that if you're doing things horticulturally appropriate with mulch and that the mulch is breaking down and it's got fungi growing in it, it's not a fire hazard. And I wouldn't worry about it being close to your house at all. I don't. So what the fire department, I think, would have um, concerns with branches touching the structure. So you might look into fire ladder conditions. Um, it's, it's not a simple discussion, and it's not really within the scope of this webinar. Um, but anytime you have a fire, high fire risk area, and you have plant material physically touching your structure, then an appropriate uh, remediation should probably be considered. Removing the branch if it's appropriate or crown raising, structurally crown raising the tree or in some way mitigating, but not necessarily removing the tree. You're speaking about the Engelman oak. Um, also, another person is asking about uh, the continued planting of Engelman in the Northern California area, San Francisco and above with the changing climate conditions. Is it still considered an appropriate species for planting? I would be more concerned with um, Phytophthora remorum, but that's just- Depending me. on where you are, yeah. Engelman's down south, isn't it? Isn't that in San Diego? Yeah. And well, the person was Pasadena. asking about replanting them up in NorCal. Oh, in NorCal. Yeah. No, I, I, it's fine. Uh, it, it's a matter of horticulture and, and uh, 
you know, you can grow all kinds of oaks and oaks are great. I favor oaks. Oaks are favorable. So um, I'm just finishing one. Okay, so to date, the information that wood chips will combust is not supported. As mulch. As mulch. And, and, and I would add to that as mulch that you're cultivating. I mean, people think of mulch in different ways. I threw it down, it's mulch, it's done. You know, I'm, I'm over with it. Oh, Vicki, get rid of the ivy out of your tree slowly and make sure that your tree is not suddenly exposed to sun where it had been protected in the past. Ivy, ivy is just, no, just say no to ivy in your tree. <laughs> <laughs> just say no. You know, one thing I want to reiterate about the flammability, because it is a huge issue in, in a lot of California communities and folks in the Bay Area have had just horrendous, the Oakland thing and uh, horrendous issues with fire. And, and that is that, you know, we don't have a culture of building fireproof houses in fire prone places. And, and this really has to be thought about. You know, you put a wood structure in a forest. I mean, come on. That's just, you're asking for it. And so, again, it's, it's not the trees per se, because tr all trees are going to burn. I, there is no good fire retardant or fire resistant tree list. All that stuff is bunk. Um, I don't care whose list it is. They're pretty much all bad. And they, don't, they don't have any meaning when it's a wildfire with a 70 mile an hour wind blowing it up a hill toward your house, everything will burn, including the glass in your windows. So, you know, in the face of those kinds of fires, you, these lists are meaningless. They have no meaning. The only thing that has meaning is not having fuel next to your house and having a house that is in itself not fuel. And that's, that's the tricky part, okay? And I, I'm reminded of it out here because in the desert, everybody loves their stucco. And um, it's actually a good thing where you're in a part of the desert landscape that's in a forest and you've got a stucco house because there's no wood eaves. There's no vents that have wood framing inside them. So the houses are very fireproof here. And, and that's, you know, try to shift your thinking away from the landscape. And sure, you, you don't want to have laddered fuels where you have dead brush or dead grass next to a shrub that's dead, next to a tree with dead wood in it right next to your house. I mean, that is asking for it. Um, laddered fuels are bad. Oh, and I just uh, saw that the person that was asking about the Engelman Oak was actually Sonoma County, so it's oh, close. Up north, yeah. Um, Chinese pistache branches. Um, Lower branches seem to have been cut out regrowing. What? Regrowing now where cut is straight up oh. like an L. Oh, so epicormic shoots maybe? Will maybe. this problem, will this be a problem to the future shape of the tree? Yeah, it will. And in webinar three, we're gonna talk about that. So, you know, if you can hold on to that thinking for webinar three, it's all about pruning. Okay. Um, Susan, you should reach out to me privately because yes, of course, there are uh, training courses for certified arborists. Uh, most of them are pricey, but I can communicate with you about less costly ways. Hmm. Um, yeah, Igor is Igor Lechen that you're speaking about, Marilyn. Uh, tree expert in the Bay Area participate. Is this the nightmare kills trees less than two years? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're speaking about Phytophthora or Remorum, but if not, then we'll figure that out. Yeah, and you know, Tracy and I are in Southern California. And so um, this webinar is going all over the country and we, you know, we're not gonna be experts on Virginia or Colorado. Um, well, and she's asking trying, about Igor Lechen's work yeah. on a new invasive pathogen in the East Bay area. Um, well, we'd have to follow that and, 
and read about it to be able yeah. to answer the question. There was another question about will questions and responses for the session be available? I, I think that might be a bit beyond our scope, but I, I will say that if you didn't get your question answered, I'm putting my email address in the chat. And uh, two relative path pathogens, two related pathogens. So anyway, uh, hold on. The chat, actually, you guys all don't get to see. Okay, I've changed it to all attendees. So they can see the chat. Oh, it's um. There you go. Diaportha follicula folliculina and Diaporella vitricola. Well, di di um, Diaporella or Dothiorella is Dothiorella. basically the imperfect stage of Botrysphaeria. Mm -hmm. And Botrysphaeria is a canker disease that causes a lot of branch dieback on a lot of different stuff. And it's all associated with drought and warmer temperatures and climate change. So when I, and the other pathogen is a bit of an opportunist, but when I started my career in the eighties, I never saw Dothiorella or Botrysphaeria. It just wasn't around. It was here, but wasn't much of a problem. And in the last 10 years, practically everything we see is Botrysphaeria, at least in SoCal. And I'm sure NorCal is getting their share now. So um, it's going to, this is going to continue to be a problem as the drought monitor shows us in drought in different places. And we're in a terrible rainfall this year in California, not getting enough rainfall. These things amplify disease issues like Dothiorella and Botrysphaeria. So the answer to that is mulch, 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 and occasionally irrigate if you haven't been and take the stress off your trees <laughs> if you can. Um, changing range for Quercus macrocarpa? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Changing um, range. Like, can you change the range? Or? You planted in Western Texas. Hmm. See, we're, we're, again, we're, um, well, I think you, yeah, I know Janet. I think you can grow that here, Janet. Um, and it would be fine. It, it may need a little bit more water than our, our native oaks, Texas. Parts of Texas get much more water. I also think that uh, Chinese pistachio is probably one of the most difficult trees to prune to train to a good structure. That's you saying that, Tracy? Yes, that is me saying that. OK, I didn't know if you're reading. Um, she's got a nursery that have L shape on lower branches and all oh, that. I see. The boxy box store, but not dedicated nursery. Um, I can walk home with that tree on a cart, otherwise have to get somebody else with a truck. Okay, well, yeah, they're hard to correct when their structures are bad. The Chinese and you gotta put a question mark on it if you want us to answer it. Yeah. Has Phytophthora well, been knocked down in the fire ravaged areas? Phytophthora remorum? I, Which yeah, Phytophthora of the thousands? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. I think Phytophthora is pretty survivable. It can survive in soil under the burnt area. But Stephanie had that question, shouldn't Amelanchia have multiple stems as a tree? Is it a large shrub? It, is it a large shrub? Hmm. And I'm, I'm not sure what Amelanchia is. I'd have to look that up. But if it's a tree, it shouldn't be multi. What what I object to on multis are not trees that grow that way in nature, that are adapted to grow that way. Oh, service berry. Okay, that's right. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, because it didn't um, come up in uh, select trees, so I wonder if it's spelled correctly. Um, so that's more of a shrubby thing in a forest understory, and yeah, that that would be a normal growth habit. It's kind of like a dogwood would be a could be a multi. Because they never really get that big to fail. 
and they're, they're understory species. So those are things that in nature um, grow that way, and that, that's fine. What I object to is when we take something that doesn't in nature grow that way and we force it into a multiple condition through pruning or planting a bunch of the same in a, the same hole, those kinds of strategies, that's what gets us into trouble with multis. Um, okay, Marilyn, I'm not sure what you're speaking about, but whenever you have a competitive vine that has overtaken the canopy and structure of a tree, it does have to be removed from the tree carefully, particularly if the hostoria, the climbing feature of that plant has embedded itself into the bark of the tree. But there are a number of reasons to remove vines from trees carefully, one being that they have shaded the tissue of the tree, which has now altered its chemistry slightly internally so that it cannot necessarily tolerate a sudden full sun exposure. It's like hardening off a plant that has been grown in the greenhouse. You have to gradually acclimate it to direct sunlight or it can be severely damaged. Further, if you have these vines growing in and around the base of the tree where they're interacting with the root system, you have to consider how you're going to remove them. Are you going to physically remove this plant disturbing the root system of the tree? That is not preferred. Is the tree um, competing with this vine like ivy acting as a mulch under the tree? And if so, then the conditions of the hydration of the tree have to be carefully weighed as that material is removed because you're altering the ecosystem under the tree. You're altering the water conditions. You're altering the nutrient conditions. Many things are changing when you eliminate a competitive plant from underneath the canopy of a tree. So hopefully that's clarified some of that in your um, Q&A response uh, statement. Like kudzu in the south, just growing over an entire tree and enveloping it. So, you know, you're going to you basically have a plant that's shading out the thing you're trying to grow and smothering it. Okay, I see Vicky's thing coming up. How can I convince my client to keep the ivy off her property? It grows in from the creek area. The landscape designer told them once to keep it out, I remind her, but what can I tell her about ivy to convince her it's bad? Does she have pets? Strangle plants or take needed nutrients and it will take over. I guess just uh, you could let her see for herself. <laughs> I, I don't know how you change people's view of the world. That's what we're trying to do with this webinar, but um, how do you get people to see the world differently? I don't know. That's basically what you're asking. <clears throat> Um, and it's um, Hedera. If you're talking about Hedera, um, regular, you know, the common ivy that most people think of when they think of ivy, um, it's quite toxic to dogs, to pets. So you might investigate that further. And maybe you could use that as a ammunition. Oh, yeah. Rats love living in it. That's a good one. I like that. It's rodent habitat. Got to clear it out. Um, boring beetles for pines, they're not harbored in this, the mulch area or um, because ivy or other competitive plants are growing under the tree. Boring beetles, bark beetles, um, turpentine beetles, those type of things, Ips paraconfusis, dendroctinus, those type of beetles, they're going to be attracted to trees that are under stress. Uh, eucalyptus longhorn beetle, critical stress, either too much hydration or too little hydration for eucalyptus. Dr. Payne at UC Riverside elucidated that, will attract boring eucalyptus longhorn beetles to eucalyptus trees specifically. Invasive shot hole borer, there has been considerable research done on whether or not drought stress versus well-grown, uh, nutritionally healthy trees is more attractive to invasive shot hole borer. And that seems to be variable among species. 
So most of them, it does not seem to show a substantial difference in the level of health of the tree. But according to Dr. Ben Faber in yesterday's avocado webinar, he mentioned that well hydrated and well nutritionally supported avocado trees seem to be less susceptible to invasive shot hole borer. I, I like Danny Bruzius's question. Um, what about removing dropped deadwood in natural areas adjacent to homes for fire danger? Um, I guess it's all a matter of degree, Danny, like how close that is, how natural the area. Um, for instance, where I am here, we have a, a barranca with a creek and, and it's a naturally treated area and there's dead wood on the ground and I'm not removing it. I'm just watering it. I think if you keep that downed wood moist, and this may be an issue in SoCal where water is so scarce, um, it's not going to burn well anyway. So it's part of the mulch. It's part of the litter fall. So we, we have to, you know, reducing fuels around houses is, again, is subject keeps coming up. What you really need to do is make your house less burnable, cover it in stucco or something. But um, I did want to say something that I didn't get into the webinar, and that was that, and I will get it in with the pruning part. There, there are reasons for leaving dead portions of trees because they're habitat for birds. And some birds are very reliant on dead parts. In particular out here, um, dead sycamore stems are just really valuable to owls and also the acorn woodpecker, but uh, especially important to owls. They reproduce in those hollows on sycamores and they're very particular about it has to be sycamore, has to be a certain size of a dead branch, eight to 10 inches. And you go cutting all that out of the trees and the owls don't have anywhere to make their, their babies. And so I think as an industry, the Western chapter of ISA has been really good about beginning to educate you know, practitioners about this utility of these things, that it's a valuable part of trees. So we're beginning to change those ideas. Open question. What are your strategies when trying to combine to combat retailer advice <laughs> to the public versus the tree science community? Right. That's what this is about. This is why we are here to tell you so yes. that you, the tree owner, will combat it by not buying that, that snake oil. <laughs> that, that's the whole point of this webinar, actually. And I think it's, uh, we're trying to bail the ocean here or put salt in it, but it's still a beginning. We're trying to do something to um, get people to see trees differently and how they're cultivated a little bit differently and then do the right things. Okay, Marilyn has another question. Here, if dead trees have all their loose foliage, pine trees stripped, leaving the old trunk and branches becoming acceptable by fire inspectors, but only on large lots and when not hanging over roadways. Well, Marilyn, it's not a question, so I don't know how to answer it, <laughs> but I will agree with you. Fire inspectors, A, know very little about fire and B, know almost nothing about trees. And so they are not going to see the value in horticultural practices that we may see value, such as mulching and leaving the pine needles on the ground. There is some kind of extreme hatred and fear of pine needles because they are very flammable. Although, again, I would challenge you to catch on fire moist pine needles. It's not going to happen. Well, I haven't collected pine needles in my yard for 20 years, and I haven't had a fire in my yard yet. Have you tried to have one? I'm not going to admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. You know, um, I, I think next time, well, when we do the pruning one, my goal is to get, 
to be to have a video of me lighting things on fire. Woohoo! Yeah, I think that's going to be a valuable thing to see. At this point, yeah. we don't have any other um, open questions. Well, one just came in. What about soil conditions from stores? Don't buy it. If you live in clay soils, I don't live in soil, but and don't have the means to do compost. Um, yeah, buyer beware when you are obtaining anything called soil from a store. Or even soil amendments. Yes. Conditioners, yeah. Um, so even the, the soil providers like, um, what is it, um, Irwindale oh, Soils. Oh. Um, you know, it's really hard to find a good quality infill soil that is supportive of your current existing soil texture and conditions. And we, we are really going to try and cover this in gro the growing trees part where I talk about mulches more and compost and those products. But, you know, the nursery business is trying to, and the box stores, they're trying to sell this stuff. And a lot of it is inappropriate for the intended use. Clay soils are not bad soils, by the way. Clay soils are very, very nutrient uh, holding and water holding. Uh, they actually hold less available water than loams, but nonetheless, clays grow plants so well and they're, un they're, they're inconvenient to deal with because of their shrinking and swelling and stickiness and all the things that clays can do, but uh, clays can be modified through mulching over time, particularly where you have perennial plantings and you don't have to dig around in it all the time. So clays can be dealt with, it's just challenging. Are you going just... have more of a uh, longer discussion on soils regarding tree planting and health and all of that in an upcoming webinar? Yeah, a little bit more, at least on the amending side and the planting webinar next week. Okay. And then so in the cultivating webinar, we'll talk more about mulching, co compost use, and that sort of thing. So um, we, can, we can address the clay soils issues a little bit more deeply then. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to say, you know, as a class project, I had my students collect three soils and grow seeds in them. And in order to kind of monitor what they were doing, I did it because we're all doing this remotely. And I chose a clay loam. A, a silt loam and a potting media. And which one do you think grew the seedlings the best? Well, it was the clay loam. Those plants were bigger, twice as big as all the other soils uh, and germinated more of the seeds. So clay isn't necessarily bad, it's just misunderstood. <laughs> okay. So I think we're done. We still have 100 people on the line and I thank you all for being stalwart and hanging out for the banter. The banter is the fun part. Um, but we, we have next Wednesday and we'll resume with planting and some of the issues concerning that. And boy, we've got some snake oil to talk about in that lecture, so. And that's next Thursday. You said Wednesday, but I don't want to confuse uh, folks. Yeah. So next First, Thursday. Thank you. Um, thank yeah, you, somebody Alexa. also said that some of the links apparently may say Sunday on them. Really? The final three. So you might check on that as just a structural detail. I'm not. I don't know what the person was looking huh. at, other than something that said the last three were on Sundays. No, everything and, is on Thursday. So which is what yeah, I put Thursdays. In the chat, but you know, if, I'll if look into it. Yeah. Good to know. And um, that hand raising symbol worked really good, Alexa. So we should do that next time if we still okay, have Okay, good, yes. Internet. Sometimes my bandwidth doesn't seem to support video. So if that works, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, okay, that was good. Um, when will the uh, recordings be available? We don't know. We don't know. Um, and somebody was going to take some of the links and information to their upcoming uh, oh, city, city council, council meeting. meeting? They yeah. have the links. But if not, then I guess not. Yeah, at some point. Yeah. Sooner, not later. <laughs> OK. And with that. So we'll see you guys all next week. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank yeah. you.
Thank you, Tracy and Alexa, for helping. Oh my God.